Well, brethren, we are here to celebrate the beginning of God's great plan for mankind. The festival that comes here in the early spring, Feast of Unleavened Bread. God focuses in and inspired uh, Moses on uh, in a couple of uh, locations in the scripture to focus in very specifically on the harvest nature of God's festivals because God's festivals are about the great spiritual harvest that God is conducting. Now, in the book of Exodus chapter 23, verse 14, we read three times, you shall keep a feast unto me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you in the time appointed of the month of it. For in it you came out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you've sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when you've gathered in your labors out of the field. Now we focus that there are three specific times during the year. One comes in the early spring in the month of it. The other comes in the time of the celebration of the harvest of the first fruits. And the other comes in what is termed the end of the year, the revolution of the year. It is a reference that's a reference in the Hebrew to the to the autumn equinox, uh, which comes at the time the feast of in gathering uh, occurs uh, it, it occurs at uh, you know in that uh, in that time frame. That uh, uh, so we find three different festivals that are located three different festival seasons and the harvest aspect is emphasized in all three. Now sometimes we may read over it with the first. It talks about the feast of unleavened bread, but it emphasizes something here with the first festival that is not mentioned with the other festival seasons, and that is the name of the month. Now, elsewhere in the scriptures, you'll read, uh, and, and uh, in terms of the Feast of Tabernacles, for instance, it comes in the seventh month. Uh, but the name of the month is not emphasized, whether uh, the Pentecost, as we generally term the Feast of First Fruits Harvest or the Feast of Weeks, uh, the, the name of the month, the month seven, is, is not emphasized. The name of the month Tishri, which is when the fall festivals come, is not emphasized because the meanings of those names is not particularly relevant for the uh, that particular festival, but the month Abib. The word Abib, or Aviv in Hebrew, is a term that means green ears, and it's a reference to new growth, to the beginning new growth, the, the fresh new growth of spring. Now, there are three aspects of the harvest that are outlined here. One is the time of fresh beginnings. It's the time when the little green ears begin to pop up out of the ground. And then we have a celebration of the first fruits harvest. And then we have a celebration of the great ingathering. Now, that is reflective of the whole plan and purpose of God. There is a time in the spring that emphasizes fresh growth, a new start, a new beginning for all of us. The spring is a time when new life comes forth. And the spring festivals focus in on that time when the whole beginning of the process was made possible because our Savior gave himself for us that is highlighted by the Passover. And as we're going to see today, the Feast of Unleavened Bread tying directly in. This first festival, the three times in the year, the three, uh, the, the three times of the harvest. One is the beginning. You've got to have growth before you can have a harvest. You've got to have something beginning to come forth. And so we are here to celebrate that Feast of Unleavened Bread, the time that is to be uh, focused on in the month of green ears, the month of new growth. Now, there are two things we're told about this. One is it's to be celebrated in, a, in the month of green ears, in the month of fresh green growth. And it is also to be celebrated in the context that it is a memorial of the Exodus. For in it you came out from Egypt. Now, we're going to look at that a little more closely. Then we see here the, the Feast of First Fruits Harvest and the Feast of Ingathering, or Feast of Tabernacles, 
as we more commonly call it. But God is in the process of a great spiritual harvest. And we have the opportunity of being a part of that, a part actually of the first fruits of what God is doing. Now, as we pick up the story here in the book of Exodus, God introduced himself and began the process of bringing his people out of Egypt. God introduced to them the whole plan and purpose that he had. He introduced to them the festival times, the festival seasons. Now, to begin with, God began to deal with Moses. And he told Moses, he said, I have a job for you. I want you to go back to Egypt, where from whence you came 40 years earlier. I want you to go back to Egypt and tell, my, and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I'm sending you back there. Now Moses began to make excuses. You know, sometimes we find ourselves with something, maybe, and we're a little bit intimidated by what seems to set in front of us. And Moses said, well, Lord, if I go back there, and I, why would anybody believe me? I'll go back and I'll tell them that you sent me, and they'll say, yeah, sure. How am I going to convince them? It won't work. I can't go back there because they'll never believe you sent me. And God said, I'll take care of that part of it. You don't need to worry about, about that. I can, am perfectly capable of demonstrating where I'm working. He said, Moses, you have a rod in your hand, throw it down on the ground. And when he did, it became a slithering serpent. Then he told him what I think for most of us would have been the real test of faith. He said, now pick it up. Throwing it down wouldn't have been the hard part is when somebody tells you grab it by the tail and pick it up. And of course he did, and it turned back to the rod. And God said, look, I'm, I'll take care of letting people know that I sent you. And Moses had another excuse. He said, well, Lord, I really don't think I'm the, I'm the fellow for it. Uh, you, you know, I don't speak very well. I, I, ne I never could, uh, you know, pass all my speeches in Spokesman's Club, and, and uh, uh, I, I'm not eloquent, and, and, and uh, you know, maybe sort of gotten rusty on the language. I've been away from Egypt 40 years. I, I can't go back and do that. God said, who do you think made the mouth? Who made the tongue? You know, offering excuses to God as to why we can't do what he wants us to do is not a real winning proposition because who should have known? So God instructed Moses and he said, you go back and you do what I've instructed you to do. I have a job for you. And Moses went back and he began to uh, he called, they, he called uh, the people together, and, and uh, he went to, went to Pharaoh, as we read recorded in, in Exodus 5. One, he said, the Lord God of Israel said, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh says, why should I do what the God of Israel says? I don't even know him. Now, that was a big mistake on Pharaoh's part because God, in effect, said, well, Pharaoh, let me introduce myself. By the time I get through with you, Pharaoh, you're going to know quite a bit about the God of Israel. But in the meantime, Pharaoh said, obviously, these folks have got too much free time on their hands. They're, all, they're talking about going and celebrating some feast somewhere. Let's make it harder on him. And, of course, what did the people do? They began to gripe and complain and say, Moses and Aaron, you've made things worse. You've made things worse. You've called Pharaoh's attention to us, and now we're really in trouble. Well, as you come on down through the story, God sent Pharaoh, sent Moses back in, in Exodus chapter 7, and he told him to go in, and, and uh, the first miracle that was performed, or the first plague, rather, as we read on down in verse 20 of Exodus chapter 7, that all of the water in the Nile River was turned to blood. And then as we come on down, chapter 8, we find that the nation was smitten with a plague of frogs. And there were frogs everywhere. Now you have to consider that the Egyptians worshipped the Nile River as the giver of life, and uh, God, through a miracle, uh, turned it into the very symbol of death. The Egyptians worshipped the frog. That was the symbol of wisdom. 
Uh, they wanted to be smart. Boy, they had it everywhere. And it talks about, you know, all there were just frogs all over the place. I always liked the illustration. And you remember the old Bible story book Mr. Basil Wolverton did years ago? And he had a picture in there. And here's Pharaoh, and his eyes are bugging out. He's got his cup and a little frog uh, popping up out of the uh, inside of the cup, sort of looking over the edge at him. And I don't know if a frog came out of Pharaoh's cup or not, but when you read the account here, you find that frogs came from seemingly everywhere. They had frogs all over the place. Then the third plague, a plague of lice that uh, contaminated throughout the land. And uh, uh, then the fourth plague on here in chapter 8 was a plague of flies and swarms of all these noxious insects. Well, about this time, verse 25 of Exodus 8, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I'll tell you what. I've been thinking this thing over, and you want to go sacrifice to the God of Israel. You can sacrifice to the God of Israel, but you need to do it here in the land. You need to do it in Egypt. Now, Moses explained to him, he said, that's not, that's not going to work. The things that we do in our service to God are an abomination to you Egyptians, and the things you do are an abomination to us. We're not going to do it that way. Now, there's a lesson here. You know, the devil comes at God's people in a variety of directions. Sometimes it's a frontal assault from the outside, and tremendous pressure and, and uh, problems are brought to bear. A frontal assault. Now, you know, that can sometimes be uh, difficult, and that can be intimidating, but when you see it coming, and you know what's happening, you can sort of brace yourself, and, and with God's help, you, you know, well, no, I'm not going to let this throw me. But a frontal assault is not the only way the devil has it getting at people. In fact, what we see here is he tried the frontal assault, you see. Pharaoh tried to intimidate, and that didn't work. So now what does he do? He offers a compromise. Brethren, you can't serve God on the devil's terms. Pharaoh, in effect, said, look, you can serve your God, but stay here in Egypt. Stay here and be a part of us. You stay here in Egypt and serve your God. God's message from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation is to tell his people to come out. Isn't that what he told Abraham? You can read it back in Genesis chapter 12. Where he told Abraham, he said, get you up out of your father's house, away from your kindred, away from from where you are, and go to a land that I will show you. Come out of Babylon, in effect, he told Abraham, because Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees, which was a, uh, a very a close uh, uh, suburb. It was a part of the Babylonian kingdom. It was part of Chaldea. He told Abraham, in effect, to leave the area of Babylon and go to where I will show you. So we're introduced, you see, in the beginning of Genesis. Just a couple of chapters earlier, we're introduced to the city that Nimrod built. We're told, you know, in Genesis 10, that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And a great tower was built there. That represented one whole approach to civilization. When God called Abraham a few years later, or a number of, not an excessive number of years later, a, a generation or so later, he told him to leave, to come out of that area. When you end up the book of Revelation, back in Revelation 18, what's God's message to his people? Speaking of Babylon the Great, he says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you be not partakers of her plagues. God called his people out from beginning to end. Now that's sort of interesting because that's what the word church means. If you go back and look it up in the Greek, it the word ekklesia, it comes from two words in, in the, uh, uh, the Greek, ek, uh, which basically means from, and uh, uh, ecclesia, or, which is, a, a, uh, uh, is derived from, from a root term that means uh, to call. So it means literally to call from. Called from, and, and it was used in, in referring to an assembly, but ultimately it was an assembly that was called out by God. The story of the people of God from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, is a people called out to worship God and to serve Him, to fulfill His purpose and His plan for their lives. Pharaoh offered a compromise, and he said, you can worship God right here. And Moses said, oh no. So, more plagues. Chapter 9, we read the fifth plague. The cattle of Egypt died. 
And on down a little further in verse 10, we read of the plague of boils that came upon the land. And on down in verse 23, we read of a plague of hail. Hail and lightning. I tell you, hail can be a pretty fearsome and, and intimidating thing when you're in the middle of it and it's coming down all around you. Now, as we come on down through the story, we find that uh, the situation continued on and Pharaoh finally decided he uh, sent word here in chapter 10. In verse 8, Moses and Aaron were again brought before him. And uh, Pharaoh said, I tell you what, I've thought about it and I'm going to let you go serve your God. But now, let me ask you something. Who is it exactly that's going to go? Who's got to go with this thing? And then Moses said, well, all of us. Our young, our old, our son, our daughters, our flocks, our herds, everybody. Pharaoh said, oh, no, no, I, I can't let you do that. No, uh, look, you're going to get out there and there's going to be trouble. I, I better take care of the kids. You leave the kids here with me. I'll take care of them. I'm real concerned about the kids. You know, I'll let you go and your little ones look to it. For, for evil is before you. You know, I'm just really concerned y'all are going to get out there and there's going to be trouble. I better watch the kids. See, the devil offers compromise. The first thing he says is, if you're going to worship God, if you're bound and determined to worship God, then worship Him in Egypt. Remain part of the world. Second thing is, all right, if you're bound and determined to, to do it, at least let me take care of the kids. See, the devil offers to babysit. And sadly, there have been a number who have taken him up on it. Moses told him, no. Pharaoh said, I'll let the men go. And Moses said, no, all of us go. Well, that wouldn't satisfy. So now an east wind came in blew the eighth plague, which was locust. That's sort of interesting. You know, the Egypt, the Egyptians uh, deified and worshipped the east wind as their protector from locusts because normally the locusts came in from uh, the west and the, and the east wind, which, which blew in from the Red Sea, uh, blew the uh, locusts out to the desert. Now, an east wind blew them in, the very thing they looked to to protect them. And, you know, we're going to increasingly see that in this society before this age comes to its conclusion. We're going to find the things that we've placed our trust and our confidence in as a nation are not going to be able to deliver us. Our science and our technology are not going to deliver us from the plagues that are to come. Our military prowess and might is not going to deliver us from the invasions that are to come. Our great uh, economic uh, skill and our great uh, uh, vaunted uh, uh, economy is not going to protect us from scarcity and want. Things that most people in this country don't even imagine can happen to them. Cannot imagine. And I'll tell you, brethren, things can change oh so quickly. Oh so quickly. Now, the plague of the locusts came in, and then the ninth plague, which was the plague of darkness. So at this point, Pharaoh offered a third compromise. Verse 24, he called Moses and he said, Go serve the eternal, but let your herds and your flocks stay here with me. If you're going to leave Egypt and you're going to take the family with you, don't commit your resources. Leave them here for me. No, you can't worship God on the devil's terms. Now, we're going to come back here and, and notice some things that we have to, to look at on this, but you know the story. There was yet to be another plague, a tenth plague. God inspired Moses to call the Israelites together and give them instruction about choosing out a lamb because he said the time is coming. In a matter of a few days, on the evening of the fourteenth day of the first month, that I will pass through the land. I will pass through the land at midnight and I will smite the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast. I will smite them dead. Death will reign throughout the land. And the only ones to be spared from that are those who are under the blood of the Lamb. Those who have taken the blood of the Lamb and put it on their doorposts. And when I see the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over that home. I will pass through the land and smite it with death. And I will pass over those 
who are protected by the blood of the Lamb. And so they were instructed as to what to do. And you remember the story that within a short time after midnight there was great uh, weeping and wailing because the firstborn were smitten. And there was a great cry in Egypt. And the Israelites were thrust out. People were in a hurry to get rid of them. And that brings us to one of the first things that we ought to take notice of as we look at this Days of Unleavened Bread. You know, there, according to Exodus 23, there are two things. One has to do with the fact that it is a time, it is celebrated in the context of the month of, of fresh green growth. It represents a fresh start. But we're also told that it celebrates our journey out of Egypt. For in it you came out from Egypt. Now, when they came out, they came out with a sense of urgency. The journey out of Egypt, those who successfully completed that journey out of Egypt, had to have a sense of urgency. In uh, Exodus chapter 12, right here, we find that uh, uh, in verse 33, uh, the Egyptians told them, in verse 32, take your flocks and your herds and be gone. The Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. There was a sense of urgency. In verse 39 of Exodus 12, they baked unleavened cakes of dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any little. Now, unleavened bread was the bread of haste. If you had company that dropped in and you wanted to feed them, you made unleavened bread. Because leavened bread took time to rise. You had to set it out. You had to let the you had to give it time to rise. They didn't have, you know, the Circle K or the corner store that they could run down to and pick up some bread because they had somebody to drop in. And neither could they, when they bake their bread, you know, bake up a great big batch and stick some of it in the freezer, uh, you know, just uh, to sort of have when, when they needed it. They baked their bread on a daily basis. And if you were in an unexpected situation, what you baked was unleavened bread because that could be done in a few minutes. You just made up the dough and put it on the griddle and, and uh, there it was. So unleavened bread was the bread of haste. It was the bread of urgency. And this festival carries with it a connotation of urgency. The exodus from Egypt was to be done in a sense of or with a sense of urgency. It was not something to take casually, lackadaisically. Not something to take carelessly or casually. The book of Exodus, and the book of Deuteronomy, rather, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy 16, 1. Observe the month of Abib. Keep the Passover unto the eternal your God. In the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out, brought you forth out of Egypt by night. Down in verse 3. You shall eat no leavened bread. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Therewith even the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you might remember the day when you came forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. You came out in haste. There is a sense of urgency that we are to have in leaving Egypt behind. There will be attempts, in effect, a frontal assault to discourage us, to overwhelm us, to get us to sort of uh, give up and not really, uh, uh, you know, to hold us there by uh, by fright or by intimidation or by uh, the various techniques uh, that way. And there will be attempts to hold us by compromise, to get us to sort of water down God's requirements and God's standards. Satan is out to pull us as we focus here on the first of the festivals, the three harvest seasons, three aspects of God's harvest, we're confronted with the fact that this is a season that focuses on our journey, the beginning. And it's to be done with a sense of urgency. 
when God told them back in Exodus 12 that they were to eat the Passover, He said, you are to be in a state of preparation. You're to have your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. They were to have a sense of urgency, not a careless, casual sense of indifference. I'll guarantee you by the time the death angel passed through the land, uh, their urgency got more urgent. Uh, you can imagine, you know, as, they, as the reality began to really settle in on them, uh, that uh, they began to take some of these things pretty seriously. And that's that's an important characteristic. That's an important aspect. You know, the starting point that we've, we've looked and mentioned before that if you want to, if you want one verse that really sums up the meaning of the Passover, you find it back in Romans chapter five, where we're told that God commends his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That really sums up what the Passover is all about. God took the initiative in our lives. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. All right, that sums up the Passover. But that's where some want to stop, and that really is only the starting point. As Paul goes on to explain in Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We want to just stay in Egypt? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God spared Israel at the Passover. He spared those who were under the blood of the Lamb, not so they could remain as slaves in Egypt, but so they could leave Egypt. They were spared. Their lives were spared so that they might be free to come out of Egypt and to serve God. To enter into a relationship with Him to fulfill their calling. It's important that we understand as we are right here at this beginning of this festival that a part of what is focused upon in the festival is the journey that we make out of Egypt. God has spared us. He took the initiative and spared us through the Passover. But he spared us for a purpose. Not so that we might remain in Egypt, but so that we might come out from Egypt but we need to come out with a sense of urgency. We need to have that motivation, that sense of urgency. That's very important. Now, let's go on a little further. What, what stood in the way of the successful completion of the journey? Because most of the Israelites who left Egypt with Moses did not enter the promised land. They started the journey. And they were pretty urgent right there at the beginning. But it didn't last, did it? Well, notice the key here. It's explained in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's sermon. Stephen sort of gives the summary history of the nation of Israel. He talks about God calling Abraham, giving him the covenant of circumcision. He talks later about the family of Abraham, his uh, grandson, great-grandson, and others uh, going down into Egypt. And then the situation continued on, and we find, uh, come down to the story of Moses, we find in verse 22 of Acts 7 that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in words and in deeds, and when he was 40 years old, he began to recognize the need of making a decision as to where he stood. And, of course, he tells the story of his intervention to save one of the Israelites, and than his subsequent flight from Egypt. Moses had to flee in verse 29. He was a stranger in the land of Midian. Then, as we come on over, uh, in verse 36, he we read of Moses, Stephen says, that, uh, that he brought them out. After that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. A reference to the Messiah. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. With the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles, the living law, the living word of God to give unto us. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. 
Brethren, Israel of old came out of Egypt with their feet, but with their heart they stayed there. They never left Egypt in their heart. They lacked commitment to their journey. Their commitment was shallow. We need a sense of urgency for our journey, but we have to go beyond the sense of urgency to a depth of commitment. Israel lacked a depth of commitment because in their hearts they had never turned loose of Egypt. They loved this world in its ways. They looked back longingly. You know, it's amazing how our memory can sometimes serve as a filter. Here they were when they were in Egypt. They were miserable. They were unhappy. Uh, they cried out to God for deliverance. And then what happened? They were brought out. What did they begin to do? Well, they began to find things to complain about because it didn't go just the way they thought. You know, God didn't just pick them up on a feather, on a feather pillow and just sort of float them gingerly from Egypt to the promised land. The Christian life isn't that way, is it? So they began to complain. They complained that they, they, were, they were hungry, wanted something to eat. God gave them food, miraculously. Manna. Well, that's fine. Okay, for a little while, and pretty soon they began to complain because they said, man, you're always giving us the same stuff. We like a little variety. Boy, back in Egypt, we had all these leeks and onions and garlic. And we had melons, we had fish, we had all this good stuff. And all we got is this. All that is is angel's food. We're tired of that. Oh, they complained about one thing and another. But in their hearts, they turned back again to Egypt. They said unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. They made a calf in those days. They remembered that from Egypt. You know, you can take the people out of Egypt a lot more simply and easily than you can take the Egypt out of the people. They turned back to Egypt in their heart when they were confronted with obstacles, when they were confronted with adversity, with difficulty. They looked back longingly to what they had left behind and their minds sort of filtered out all the problems. And they began to hanker for the good old days. They wanted to hold on to the attitudes, to the customs, to the approach of Egypt. Brethren, how much of the world are we bringing with us? Have we left it behind in our hearts? Have we turned our back on the decadent value system of this world, of this society? Oh, it permeates the airwaves. It comes at us from all directions. A society, a culture that is based on greed, on immorality, on things that are decadent. Have we rejected it in our heart? Because you see, that is the basis of a journey that is made based on a commitment. They did not reject Egypt in their heart. On over in Hebrews 11, we read of Moses. In Hebrews 11, we read down in verse 27, speaking of Moses. You know, in verse 24, when he came to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt. They carried Egypt with them in their hearts. Moses forsook Egypt. You know, Moses wasn't tempted to worship the golden calf with them. Because he had left Egypt. In his heart, in his mind. It wasn't just that his feet walked out of Egypt. His heart had turned away from Egypt. Moses came to a point in his life where he had to make a decision. Because you see, Moses had been adopted into the royal family. Into the royal family of Egypt. He grew up as a prince of Egypt. He was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, we're told in Acts 7. Stephen says he was a man mighty in words and deeds among the Egyptians. He was noted for his accomplishments. He was on the way up. He was a prince of Egypt, a part of the royal family. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, tells us that he was a general in the Egyptian army. 
ties in with what Stephen says about being a man mighty in deeds. He was a man of renown in Egypt by the time he was 40 years of age. And at that point, he came to a juncture in his life where he had to make a decision. Was his future with Egypt, or was it with the people of God? Now, you look around at the people of God, as he must have done, and he thought, man, what a ragtag bunch. They're all a bunch of slaves out here making bricks. I can be part of the elite, the ruling elite of Egypt. Now, with whom are you going to cast your lot? Here you got a bunch of slaves over here, and you got the ruling elite of the nation. Which one do you want to be associated with? You know, if Moses had only looked on the human level, he'd have said, you know, I think that really being associated with the ruling class in Egypt is pretty pretty nifty thing. You got wealth, you got power, you got status, you got all the things that people want, right? Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, we're told in Hebrews 11.25. And one of the things to realize is, you see, when Moses made his decision, he didn't know how God was going to use him. See, Moses didn't know all of the details of what came later. He hadn't read the book yet. But the book hadn't been written. Moses made a decision based on what he knew. And he made a choice that if he had to suffer as one of God's people, that was better than all of the things that Egypt could offer. There was a depth of commitment. Moses rejected Egypt in his heart and mind. He turned his back on Egypt in his mind. And if you turn your back on something in your heart and mind, it becomes a pretty simple matter of putting it into practice. Moses actually walking out of Egypt wasn't the hard part. Turning loose of it in his mind. Because you know, Egypt has its own. There is an attraction. There's a glitter. There's a glamour. You ever seen pictures of the treasures of Egypt? There was back several years ago, I think they came to New Orleans and were on ex exhibition, and they were in Memphis and two or three other places across the United States, uh, some of the treasures, which were basically of the same time period as Moses, the treasures of King Tut. And it, it was very impressive. Oh, you looked at the gold and the jewelry and all of the beautiful things. It was beautiful. And you know, the Moses had to make a commitment. And his commitment involved the rejection of all those things. He made choice. Now, we saw earlier when we looked that Pharaoh offered compromises. He, uh, he tried to intimidate them and, and to just scare them out of doing anything. Then he tried to get them to compromise. Commitment can be undermined from different angles. It can be undermined by a frontal assault, uh, by a frontal assault that's intimidating and overwhelming. And it can be undermined by a spirit of compromise that sort of eats away like rot and decay from underneath until the foundation is eaten away and the whole thing begins to collapse. You see, the devil, you can go through the book and the devil has used both tactics over and over. Well, the journey that we're called upon to make is to be made with a sense of urgency, and it must be coupled with a depth of commitment. A depth of commitment that we are in it for keeping. That commitment has to involve a rejection of Egypt. A rejection of spiritual Egypt. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, First Corinthians chapter 10, we read the story of, beginning up in verse 1, of some of what happened to ancient Israel. We read in verse 2 that they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. You know, they were, they were immersed in water. They had it on both sides, and of course the cloud was on top of them. That's water vapor. 
They were totally surrounded by water. It's the only case I know of somebody that got baptized and never got wet. They were immersed in water. It just sort of stayed away from them. They baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did drink of the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with many of them, God wasn't well pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. These things are our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as some of them were. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted. Neither murmur you as some of them murmured. All these things happen unto them for examples or for types for us. They're written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. We are to learn lessons from what Israel went through coming out of Egypt. Now, we're told as we come on down in verse 14 that we have to flee from idolatry. And then Paul begins to explain something in verse 16. He says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The word communion in verse 16, the word partakers in verse 18, the word fellowship up in verse 20, are all exactly the same word in the Greek. They mean basically to have in common, something that's shared, something that's had in common. So, when we partake of the Passover symbols, the symbols of Christ's sacrifice, the symbols of his blood and of his body, that is something we all collectively share, we have in common, we are all collectively participating. When Israel offered sacrifices at the altar, they were collectively sharing, partaking, participating in fellowship with God. When they offered the sacrifice, you know, a portion was burned on the altar, a portion was taken by the priest, and a portion was taken by the offerer. And it was a picture of entering into fellowship with God, a close, intimate fellowship. They were partakers, sharers of the altar. They participated. Now, Paul went on to say, he said, now, in terms of idolatry, Verse 20, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. I don't want you sharing things with them. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of demons. You can't have your foot in both camps. You can't walk with God and run with the devil at the same time. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. We're told back in the book of James. No, so Paul goes on down and he explains here what we are to do. That attitude, that approach. There involves a depth of commitment of turning our back on the ways of this society. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. There is something that is going to endure perpetually on into eternity. And there is something that is passing away that's going to be in the ash heap. That's going to be going into oblivion and destruction. And we have to examine our commitment. Our commitment. to what is it that... Where is our loyalty? Where is our allegiance? Where is our devotion? If we, if our love, if our loyalty and, and allegiance is to a whole system of values, a way of thinking, a way that's reflected in lust and greed and vanity and jealousy, lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, that is a whole set of values that is passing away and it won't endure. We have to examine our values. How much of Egypt are we taking with us in our heart? And you know, brethren, all of us, from the sense of go off and live in a cave and and, and be in a total vacuum, we have to live in the world and yet not be out the world. Because we're to be a light, an example, by the fact of the way we live, the way that we conduct ourselves. It involves a commitment. 
The journey out of Egypt must involve a sense of urgency. It must involve a depth of commitment. And it is a journey that is made based upon faith. Go back to Hebrews 11 once again. Hebrews 11, we read in verse 24, that Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It doesn't say there's nothing pleasurable about sin. It says the pleasures of sin are temporary. He esteemed reproach for Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. He had respect unto the recompense of his reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The journey was made based upon faith. Moses believed God. God was more real to him than Pharaoh and all the things Pharaoh had to offer. You know, the, the Egyptians really placed a lot of emphasis on material things. Uh, we, we've all heard the statement, you can't take it with you. Well, the Egyptians tried. They tried. They built pyramids and they took as much with them as they thought they could put in there. Of course, it didn't do them any good. And a few years later, somebody else eventually figured a way to sneak in there and take it out. And so that most of the tombs were looted long since. But you know what? The people that looted them, they couldn't take it with them either. Sort of like the fellow you, you heard back, it's been, I think, within the last couple of years, some, some guy that, was, that died and he wanted to be buried in his Cadillac. Want to be buried in his car, and it created quite a controversy there at the cemetery because uh, you know going to dig up this giant hole with a, a big uh, a backhoe and everything. He wanted to be buried in his Cadillac, and eventually he was. I don't think it's done him a whole lot of good, you know. I don't think he's been driving around anywhere in it. He took it with him, but what good did it do him? It was all buried in the ground. It's been rusted and decayed, and it's no good to anybody now. It certainly hasn't been any good to him. You know, it's hard sometimes for us to have that perspective because we look at the things that we see and those seem so real and so tangible and, and those are the things that we can touch and that we can feel and that we can get excited about. But you know, we can't take those things with us. There is a place where we can take nothing with us except that which we brought into the world. You know, Job understood that. He said, naked came I forth from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Moses understood that. Moses understood that there was things that were there, things that were enjoyable, things that were the glitter and the glamour that that his status in Egypt offered, but he recognized those things are temporary in the way of life that they reflect, that's temporary. That's not what I want. He looked for a city that had foundations. You see, Moses made a commitment to forsake Egypt in his mind because Moses believed God. And so Moses journeyed by faith. Moses acted on faith. He didn't have perfect faith. You know, he was a little bit intimidated about the idea of going back and talking to Pharaoh when God told him to go back. But you know, he went. And he had left Egypt earlier. He had left Egypt 40 years earlier than that because he made a commitment. And you see, that story ought to tell us something as well because sometimes you make a commitment to step out and do what's right and then... You know, where are all the blessings? Moses, for 40 years, was a shepherd in the desert. I mean, he went from being a general in the Egyptian army to following around some sheep in the Sinai Desert for 40 years. But Moses found something there that he couldn't find in Egypt. He was walking with God, and he had a relationship with God. Moses made a decision in his mind. And that decision was based on faith. God was more real to him than Pharaoh was. See, not fearing the wrath of the king, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. God was more real. Moses was more concerned about what God thought. And so Moses left Egypt in faith. And he came through, as we're told, in 
On down to verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. Well, the Egyptians must have sort of stood on the, on the seashore and sort of scratched their head and thought, well, I don't know how they did it, but, uh, you know, working for them, bound to work for us too. And they started to cross and they found out it weren't necessarily so people of God reached the other side, and that was all there was for the Egyptians. You see, they crossed the Red Sea in faith. Moses led them across. You know, can you imagine? Vast walls of water on either side. You can't see anything holding them up. Great wind blows across there until the mud surface becomes crusted where you can walk on it. Well, that's pretty impressive. You're going to step out and you're going to you're going to go across. You go across and keep looking up on either side. Here's these great mountains of water. Our journey is a journey that has to be made by faith. If we go back to Hebrews chapter two, or actually Hebrews three. Hebrews 3, verse 5, Moses truly was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Hold it fast unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Now take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily while it is called a day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin has a way of sneaking up on us. You're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You see, it's not just a matter of how we start out. Egypt, Israel started out of Egypt... They came out with a high hand. They were excited. They were exuberant. They were free. They started out. They had the sense of urgency. I guarantee you the death angel passed through and smite the firstborn all over the place uh, dead. And you escaped. You were spared. You talk about a sense of urgency to get out of there. And besides, there have been all these other plagues. And somebody says, you ready to leave? You bet. You know, show me the door. Well, they came out with a sense of urgency. That, in one sense, was the easy part because, you see, a sense of urgency without a depth of commitment is short-lived. You can be emotionally charged up and have a sense of urgency about you, but if there's not a depth of commitment in your heart, a commitment to a way of life and something that is based on faith, that you believe it to the depth of your being, if that's not there, the urgency won't be maintained. So we're warned. We have to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I've used the analogy before. I think I've used it here. I've spoken so many places. I know I hadn't used it here in the last month because I hadn't been here to speak. So, But you remember the story of the, of the, of the vineyard. You know, the laborers who were called out to the vineyard. The master called the laborers into the vineyard. And some of them started out at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh... And, and others came on at 9 and at noon and, and on 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Some didn't get out there till 5 o'clock. And when, they, when it was over with, when he showed up at 6 o'clock and called a, har a halt to the harvest, and he gave everyone what he had promised. Of course, you remember the story. Those who had been there all day began to gripe and complain. They said, wait a minute. I've been out here since 6 o'clock this morning. This fellow, he came here at 5 o'clock this afternoon. You gave him the same thing you gave me. That's not fair. And the Lord of the harvest said, Now look, you and I made a deal this morning. I offered you a wage, and, and you said that sounded great to you, and you went out to labor in the vineyard. 
I'm giving you exactly what I told you I'd give you. If I want to give the same thing to him, what's that to you? Boy, you talk about something that flies against the grain of human nature. Now, but, but let's look a little further at the parable. Because you know who didn't get paid at all? There's no reference to the Lord of the vineyard going out and looking at people in their homes and giving it to them. See, somebody who maybe came in at 6 o'clock that morning, about 3 in the afternoon, they decided, man, I've been working here a long time. I'm tired. I'm taking it to the house. There's no evidence that any of them got anything because the deal was they had to be laboring in the vineyard when the master came. The important thing is not how long have you been in the vineyard. You know, we baptized three young men in Houston last week. They've been laboring in the vineyard one week. Some of you have been laboring in the vineyard two, three, four decades and more. The point is not how long have you been laboring in the vineyard. The point is this. Did you come to the vineyard when the master called? And did you stay until the master came? See, that's what counts. That we come when we're called and we remain faithfully laboring in the vineyard. See, we've been called to do a work. Not just to rest under the vine and the fig tree. We've been called to be laborers in the vineyard. And the important thing is that we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We remain faithful. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. Some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. With whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom swore he in his wrath that they should not enter into rest? But to them that believed not. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard. You see, the journey has to be made by faith. If we don't believe God, that's the basis, really, of being able to make a commitment and to sustain that sense of urgency. Our journey is to be motivated by a sense of urgency. It must be maintained by a depth of commitment, by walking by faith. And one other characteristic that is crucial, that really ties in with all the others, and that involves a sense of mission. Our journey is not an aimless wandering and meandering. There must be a sense of mission. We've been called to go somewhere. God has called us for a purpose. The harvest aspect of God's plan starts in the early spring with fresh green growth. What is it that begins to come up in the spring? Well, that which will constitute the harvest. There is a first fruits harvest. And then there is a later harvest, the great end gathering in the fall. We are typified as the first fruits. We've been called that we should be a kind of first fruits of all his creatures. God has called us for purpose. We read back in Exodus chapter 5 that God told Israel that they were coming to that they were that Israel was to go into the wilderness. They were to come unto God to keep a feast unto the eternal. They were to make a journey. Now, if we turn back to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, after cataloging the men and women of faith in Hebrews 11, we read in Hebrews 12 verse 1 that we're encompassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. All of these individuals of faith who've gone before, let us therefore lay aside uh, every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience. Comes on through and it talks about that and tells us uh, in uh, verse 14 to follow peace with all men and holiness. 
without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. You see, God took the initiative through his grace, through his beneficence, but we can fail or fall from that grace. We are told that we must make our calling and election sure. God has called us. He has chosen us. But we must respond to God's grace. So he says, look diligently, be careful, really examine yourself. Lest we fall from the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Then he comes on down. And he tells us in verse 18. You are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word not be spoken to them any more. When they got to Mount Sinai, they came there to the mountain of God. They were absolutely intimidated and terrified by what began to transpire. The mountain began to shake and quake. And there was great fire and smoke coming up from the top. And the voice of God thundered out. And the people told Moses after the Ten Commandments were given, they said, look, uh, from now on, why don't you just tell you what, you talk to him, and you just tell us what he said. That'll be sufficient. God had already instructed Moses that boundaries were to be set about the mount. No one was to come up on the mountain and touch it, not even an animal, lest it die. Because you see, here was the holy presence of God. And we're not to treat casually, carelessly, or cheaply. Where God has placed his presence. They came to a mountain. They heard this this great uh, blast of the trumpet. They heard this voice which so intimidated them. We haven't come to that. We've come to something far more impressive. Verse 22 You're come to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, brought to completion, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling, that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Now we need to understand that we are called for a mission. We're told that uh, uh, on down here in verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth. Now as he promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. This word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Serve God with reverence and godly fear. There is a sense of mission that must permeate our lives. We've been called for something. How many times did Mr. Armstrong used to emphasize that we haven't been called now simply to get salvation. God has called us out ahead of time as the first fruits. The time is coming in the future when the vast, overwhelming majority of human beings will come up in the white throne judgment and be given an opportunity for salvation. We've been called to receive salvation, yes. But we've been called ahead of time, as it were. There is to be a sense of mission. Israel was called to come out of Egypt and not just to wander around. They were called to come out of Egypt and come to where God was leading. God had a purpose for them. He was bringing them unto himself, bringing them into a relationship with him that they might be used of him as his instruments. Brethren, as we are here at the beginning of the festival of unleavened bread, we must be filled with a sense of mission, recognizing that we've been called for a purpose. We've been called for a purpose. And there will be various things to try and get our minds away from that purpose. There will be things that seek to intimidate us. 
There will be things that seek to lull us to sleep. We will be attacked in one way or another, as all of God's people have been down through the centuries. We, if we are to successfully complete our journey, we have to have a sense of urgency, recognizing the necessity of moving forward in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Because real change starts on the inside. You know, sometimes people outwardly conform with things and do it because somebody else is watching them. And that may improve their behavior. But it doesn't solve the problem of what's on the inside. And ultimately, you see, that's what God is after. What's on the inside? Is involved in transforming us. He has called us to come unto himself. We need a sense of urgency to begin that journey, but we need a depth of commitment to reject Egypt in our hearts if we're going to maintain that urgency in that journey. We need faith because it is a journey of faith. We have to focus on him who is invisible, the living God. And we must maintain that sense of mission before our eyes. Because you see, Moses was able to turn his back on all the things Egypt had to offer because he looked for a city that has foundations. Moses saw that all that Egypt had to offer was nothing to compare with what God had in store. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us. He lays out his whole plan and purpose here in the Scriptures. Brethren, we've been called and our minds have been opened to understand the purpose that God is working out. We must never treat it lightly and casually and cheaply. We must recognize it for the value that it has. And realize that it is not only something of great value, it is the pearl of great price, but the possession of it carries with it great responsibility. We have a great mission that is set before us that God has called us to be participants in. We're here on this first beginning of this festival. Beginning of the three phases of God's plan that will bring ultimately all of mankind as a part of God's spiritual harvest. Let's take stock at this time of the year and let's focus on the lessons that God would have us derive from the beginning of this festival that we might go forward to accomplish and to achieve our great call.